Good morning if you are in the West Coast and good afternoon if you are joining us from the East Coast um, and good evening if you are joining us from Turkey or Greece like our uh, presenter and uh, discussant are. Uh, my name is Baki, Baki Tezcan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis um, and I convene the uh, online meetings of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Today, uh, well, uh, the, our our uh, chair will present to you the this uh, the presenter and also the discussant. But you know why we are here? We are here to um, honor Wangelis Kekliudis uh, grant uh, recipient of two thousand twenty two. She'll share with us her research. Um, and before we, I pass the button to Christine Filiu, the chair of this session. Let me just very briefly introduce Christine Filiu, who doesn't need any introduction to any of you, but still uh, she teaches at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, you know all, you all, all of you must know her from her books. Uh, the first one was the biography of an empire governing Ottomans in an age of revolution, uh, was also translated to Turkish, and then Turkey, a past against history, was also recently translated to Turkish. And then uh, currently she's working on a project, istanpolis.org. You can actually check that out. Uh, and it recently, just very recently, received a uh, an, an EH award. Uh, so that project will grow. It's about digitization of um, Greek Ottoman population in Istanbul. All right, Christine, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Baki, for inviting me to moderate today. Um, it's an honor, and uh, I think as many people attending here today know, this these events are very much still alive in the memory and in the lives of the people who lived through it. So it is a special, it's a special kind of discussion today and presentation. Um, Vangelis would be thrilled. He would be here with bells on, and I'm sure he is in some way. So. Uh, Thank you all for being part of that effort to create the scholarship and for applying. And congratulations, Elif, on receiving it this year. Um, I'm just going to introduce the two speakers and give them the floor. Um, Elif uh, obtained her bachelor's degree in Turkish language and literature from Boğaziçi University and then uh, pursued a master's degree in cultural studies at Şehir University. Her master's thesis focused on the first urban transformation project implemented in Istanbul, specifically the urban transformation project in Sulukule, a historic Roman neighborhood and its impact on its residents. Ozer is currently a PhD student in the Department of History at Boazici University, where she's in the final stages of completing her thesis on this topic, on the deportation of the Greek population from Istanbul in 1964-65. Our discussant, eminently qualified, is Eli Urs, who received her joint PhD and MPhil degrees in Anthropology and Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University. She completed her undergraduate studies in Sociology and Political Science and International Relations, also at Boazici, and postgraduate studies in Social Anthropology at the University College London. Her PhD dissertation, which I feel very connected to because we've been friends since the time when she was doing her field work uh, on the Rumpolites was revised and published as Diaspora of the City, Stories of Cosmopolitanism mm -hmm. from Istanbul and Athens uh, from 2018. And among her many publications on the Rumpolites is the edited volume entitled Istanbulu Rumlar ve 1964 Sürgünleri from Ile in 2019. She's in the process of completing her next book on Aegean migrations with an anthropological narrative of Leros. And she's based in Athens as a faculty member at the American College of Greece, Didi. And she's currently working on her research project on Constantinopolitans in the global diaspora of the city as a fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies of Harvard University. Uh, with that, I will pass the floor on to Elif, and then Eli will give some comments, and we'll open the floor up to questions. And if anyone would like to just share brief reminiscences of Vangelis, this would be a nice forum to do so. So first, let's begin with Elif's presentation. Thank you.
you're muted still. Now can you can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited <laughs> right now, and I actually would like to start with thank to Professor Baki Teljan for inviting me to give this talk today, and to thank to you, Hojan, Kristen, Filiu, and Eli Herers, Eli Romainers, for supporting me and uh, for your time for today and our audience for being with us today it means a lot for me thank you so much from the beginning and i would like to share my presentation with you just a second i think you can you can see my slides right okay perfect so uh the expulsion of Greek citizens from Istanbul in the mid 20th century stands as a significant yet often overlooked chapter in history. This presentation delves into the personal testimonies of those who lived through this event, shedding light on its various dimensions and offering a comprehensive view of the challenges and resilience of the deported Greeks. So uh, before beginning, I would like to clarify some points. First, I refer to Greek speaking Christian Orthodox Istanbul born group of, of people as Istanbul Rumlar in Turkish, as the Greeks of Istanbul and or Constantinopolitan Greeks used in English and Rum Polites as Eli Romainer suggested by combining two emic terms, one Turkish Rum and one Greek Polites. Words. A room which derives from Romeo's Roman denotes to connect connection to Eastern Roman but Byzantine origins. And polites, on the other hand, is used in Greek means from the city, from Constantinople, refers to the veil of identification with the heritage of Istanbul. And moreover, I will use the word apelasis as the title of this presentation, which means expulsion in Greek in general. But we, when, we, uh, when the relationship of polites with this city is taken into consideration, it has a very particular meaning of the 1964-1965 expulsion and involuntary migration of Constantinopolitan Greeks. And secondly, the Greek citizens who had to leave the country in 1964, 1965, are the children and grandchildren of those holding Greek passports who had settled in Istanbul before 1918, coming from Ottoman territories that changed hands after Greece independence, were exempt from the population exchange, and they were allowed to stay in Istanbul according to the Residence Trade and Navigation Agreement. And I would like to briefly touch upon the historical background as well. In 1964, due to the intercommunal conflicts in Cyprus, Turkey sought to bring Greece to the negotiating table. And to achieve this, on March 16, 1964, Turkey abrogated the Residence Trade and Navigation Agreement, which legitimized the residence of Greeks nations in Turkey. Although in the existing literature, while there is a consider considerable emphasis on the 1964 Cyprus crisis, it is imperative to assert that the expulsion, I mean the apelasis, holds a larger contextual significance. Greeks of Istanbul, categorized as a minority in the post-nation state era, have encountered a series of homogenization and Turkification policies throughout the history of the Republic. The 1964 expulsion is situated in this continuum. <laughs> Sorry. However, what distinguishes it from other discrimination measures is the resultant mass exodus of Greeks of Istanbul. Approximately 
12,000 individuals for various reasons, such as being accused of activities against Turkey or the non-renewal of their residence permits, were compelled to be deported. When accompanied by their Turkish citizen family members or relatives, the estimated figure surpasses 30,000. And with the witnessing of mass migration within a remarkably short period, and the participation of individuals who had come to believe that they had no future in Turkey, the departure of Istanbul Greeks from Turkey persisted in the following years. The room population, which exceeded 100,000 in, in the early years of the Republic, presently stands at less than 2,000 today. The 1964 expulsion, constitutes the most pivotal turning point in the process of the extinction of Istanbul Greeks. And uh, my research questions, how I started to, 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 to conduct my field works. What were the individual stories of the deported Greeks of Istanbul and their accompanying relatives who have always been represented by numbers? What kind of lives did these individuals have before leaving the country? How did they learn about their deportation? How did they prepare for the journey? How did they experience during this process? How did they continue their lives after leaving Istanbul? What difficulties did they face? What kind of experiences did deportation correspond to their lives? And to answer these questions, I adopt oral history as a historiographic approach and a research method. And I aim to give voice of the subject of the expulsion experience and contribute to writing an alternative history of the expulsion. In the line with the approach of oral history, Michael Frisch, it is essential to consider the concepts of anti-history and more history for explaining the contribution of this research to the literature. The fieldwork provided a perspective for anti-history which challenges established understandings of history and helped me to distance myself from official history, which argues that Turkey had right to legally deport Greek citizens and relies on one-sided official documents and manipulation of these documents as well, and criminalizes the Greeks of Istanbul. Adopting the more history approach, I aim to reveal unrecorded and undocumented aspects of the history of the expulsion through its subjects' life stories. By listening to the life stories of room politics and recording their experiences of the expulsion, I generated new sources in this field. These new sources allowed me to go beyond the boundaries of the existing literature to include the before and after the expulsion in my research. Gave me a different perspective and made possible a more bottom-up historiography to the subject of the expulsion. And in this presentation, due to the time constraints, I choose to focus on the exile, experiences of the Greeks of Istanbul, and I will not include the names of my interviews and where do I use names? I will use pseudonyms. And I missed the point, so sorry, I, I need to go back some slides because I, I forget about the mention about my field works. <laughs> this study, which aims to compile the narratives of deported individuals and their accompanying relatives, represent the first oral history study on, um, directly focused on the 1964 deportation. It is based on three distinct field research periods uh, between 2020, uh, 2020 and 2023. Two of them were in Athens and one was in Thessaloniki and resulting in the creation of an audiovisual archive comprising interviews with 80 individuals in total. And in March 2023, I conducted my fieldwork in Thessaloniki, where I had the opportunity to interview six individuals and visit the Kalamaria Municipality Historical Archive of Refugee Hellenism. And I'm grateful for the support provided by OTSA, Vangelis Kekertis Memorial Travel Grant, which made this research possible. So I was, I guess I was here, yeah. Uh, in the context of Greek citizens facing deportation, 
interview with testimonies have revealed three primary methods through which they learned about their impending deportation. Receiving a deportation notice directly from two visiting police officers at their home or workplace, or being informed about the impending deportation through acquaintances before receiving the official notice, or discovering their deportation through the publication of their names in a newspaper. So based on the testimonies gathered together during my field research, it became evident that some Greek nationals, upon learning of their impending deportation, explored various strategies to avoid leaving Istanbul. For example, you will see the, the petition campaign uh, organized for Ivis Tangali on the slide. And these strategies actually included applying for Turkish citizenship to maintain their residency, pursuing a marriage and coercion to Turkish nationality, and attempting to overturn the deportation decision through formal petitions as Evi uh, Stangali did, or by seeking assistance from influential acquaintances. However, I only encountered one account of success in this regard. One interview we recounted a situation in which a prominent member of their family was spared from deportation by paying significant bribes. In the initial phase of deportation, individuals were swiftly expelled often without having the opportunity to bid farewell to their relatives under police escort. However, in the subsequent weeks of the deportation process, a one week grace period was granted to some of the deporters. And these relatively fortunate individuals visited the consulate following their police encounter, where the consulate coordinated daily or weekly flights in collaboration with Olympic Air and provided them with flight tickets. Additionally, some deportees requested that the consulate transport certain personal belongings to them in Athens using diplomatic channels. The consulate received these items and if the recipients could be located at the provided addresses, successfully delivered them. Notably, one interviewee, Savas, shared a poignant account of his father, Dimitris, losing his cherished stamp collection at the consulate an incident that deeply affected him throughout his life. Furthermore, another interview we mentioned a discovery made years later, stumbling upon an archive in Istanbul that contained boxes filled with personal belongings left behind by deportees. These items included eyeglasses, watches, wedding rings, fountain pens, and stock certificates dating back to the Ottoman Empire. And individuals who were not accused of harmful activities, but were deported due to the expiration of their documents were permitted to ship their belongings. The items were marked for shipping from Sirkeci were also recorded in their passports. Several months later, if they were fortunate, they could retrieve their possessions in Athens. And you may see an example on the slide also. However, there was a case involving the famous painter Ivis Tangali, who had been Bedrah Meipolu's assistant and had been engaged in numerous international projects for representing Turkey. She had arranged for her entire portfolio to be sent to Sirkeci before her deportation, but unfortunately, she didn't receive it in Athens. And despite her repeated letters of complaint, she didn't receive any response while she was a renewed painter when she deported Istanbul, her inability to prove herself as a painter in Athens was a distressing consequence of this loss. And in cases involving tax evasion, Greek nationals, residences, and items at their workplace were seized by the financial authorities with taxation calculated at an elevated value. Besides the freezing of bank accounts, household possessions, and personal items were confiscated with the intention of being fortified for the treasury if taxes remained unpaid. For instance, Dimitra recounted that after her father's deportation, Minister of Finance officers visited their home and catalogued all their belongings. 
The sewing machine her father had purchased for Dimitra was the only item not included on the list because Dimitra's name was on the machine's receipt. To this day, she cherishes this sewing machine in her Thessaloniki residence as the sole family keepsake for, from her Istanbul home. And studies recollected how even the machines awaiting repair in his father's shop were documented by the finance officers. Despite this, he took the risk of returning all the machines to their owners before leaving Istanbul to prevent anyone, anyone from falling victim to this situation. In contrast, Akis vividly remembered how neighbors still feared the furniture in his parents' house, justifying it by saying, this table will be bought anyway, so we might as well replace it with ours. Akis ultimately reclaimed his childhood rocking chair, the sole relic from his early years that remains in, it, in his Athens residence today, which had been found in a neighbor's house and retrieved by force. On the other hand, the process of announcing the list of those to be deported proved to be incredibly taxing. For days, weeks, and even months, the Greeks of Istanbul come to the newspapers searching for their names and those of their relatives. They lived under the constant shadow of potential deportation, enduring prolonged psychological pressure, such as the extent of their anxiety that in the summer of 1964, when Dora witnessed her father returning home with a newspaper and ex exclaiming Kali Patrida, and finally learned of his deportation, her initial reaction was one of relief as she thought, thank God, now the uncertainty and months of anxiety are over. For her, the situation was preferable to the prolonged nerve-wracking wait. In contrast, Dimitri's family found uncertainty unbearable, knowing that as Greek subjects, they would eventually have to leave Istanbul. Faced with economic sanctions imposed by the Turkish government, the family made the decision to depart Istanbul in May 1964. Dimitri's father, Nico, whose diary can be seen on the right, the owner of the uh, one of Istanbul's largest department stores, and clandestinely sold all his merchandise to a neighbor at a fraction of its value. He then made his way to Syria with the help of a smuggler, proceeded to Lebanon via Syria, and finally reached Athens. All these efforts were undertaken to ensure the money from the store's merchandise could accompany them to Athens. Ultimately, Nico used this money to purchase a second-hand car, which he employed to restart his business, selling fabrics in the villages of Athens. And with the narratives of departing Istanbul, customs emerge as a vulnerable and challenging aspect. Evie, compared to leave Istanbul following her father's deportation, encountered sea trip searches at the airport, which constituted a distressing experience. In contrast, Pasalis, deported at the age of 18, had a distinct customs-related account. In response to his mother's request, who couldn't return to Istanbul due to the cancellation of visa agreement, he carried a set of dinner plates that had belonged to his grandmother, the sole item he could take from his home. To transport these plates, he had to resort to offering bribes to both train officials and the custom officers, expanding all the money he had in his possession. When he arrived in Athens, he found himself in the cunning square, empty plates in his hands and not a single coin in his pocket. And the interviews posed the greatest challenge when it comes to recounting the initial days of life in Greece. The narratives constantly, consistently revolved around themes of poverty, destination, destitution, loneliness, lack of support, yearning for Istanbul, and hopelessness. According to the interviewees, their endeavor to build a life in an unfamiliar place after leaving Istanbul essentially entailed a drastic social decline and a struggle to rebuild their lives from scratch. For instance, 
Vasilis found it difficult to convey how, in the first days of their arrival in Athens, they spent nights on chair in Vatisukai, disembarking from the bus. They eventually rented a cramped one-room apartment with acquaintances, where the heat from the bakery downstairs made it nearly unbearable to stand. Three deported families attempt to coexist in this small space for months. And similarly, Chrissy recounted how her father in his 60s, when he was deported, and a former owner of a mechanic shop in Istanbul, had to hastily accept the first job he could find after spending a few days in a hotel upon their arrival in Athens. He resorted to working as a car washer in Sikaramaga, a port town far from Athens, and attempted suicide on his way home from work. Among the testimonies, there were also accounts of relatives who had taken their own lives, especially during the early stage of deportation. Premature deaths, heart disease, and cancer were often attributed to the consequences of the deportation and the hardships endured in Greece. Numerous room politics in Athens, especially those with relatives, made efforts to minimize their first stay and rapidly secured employment in various available positions. All the Greeks encountered challenges in finding work, but family members, notably the mothers of households who hadn't previously worked in Istanbul, entered the workforce in Athens. These occupations, encompassing domestic service, caregiving, and love skilled factory labor, were characterized by informality, physical demands, and job instability. Women, constrained by traditional values, found these roles not only physically taxing, but also mentally draining due to the limited social interaction. Furthermore, interviewees who were younger at the time noted that dual commitment to work and education, managing their expenses with small incomes, and striving to expedite their academic progress. And upon arriving in Athens, some of the room politics found employment relatively easily due to their higher education levels compared to the local population. However, this group constituted a minority. Some of my interviews remember Plataea Vatis as a place where they could find employment. Plataea Vatis, the final stop for Istanbul buses in Athens, initially served as a gathering place for Greeks from Istanbul waiting for or searching for their relatives. Over time, as the number of job seekers increased, the square took on a new role. Construction foremen in need of daily laborers started hiring affordable workers from this location. The construction sector in Athens had experienced rapid growth due to the post-occupation and post-war reconstruction, urgent need of work. Oh, sorry, reconstruction efforts providing a new avenue for Greeks from Istanbul in urgent need of work. Carpenters and electricians who had previously owned shops in Istanbul transitioned into craftsmen in the construction industry. And those without prior experience found opportunities for daily wage labor and tasks like tile laying or sand carrying, which required relatively minimal expertise. And the Greek state supports while the Greek government didn't establish a specific policy for room politics, it did offer certain social benefits, including the opportunity for paid military service. You may see a received example for paid military service on the slide. One year of in-kind assistant, the ability to count days work in Turkey toward retirement and admission to universities without entrance exams. However, Greek governments during this period underwent frequent changes and there were no consistent, stable or systematic practices in place. It remains unclear to what extent the individuals who often struggled to engage with the Greek state were able to access these forms of support. To, to illustrate the state provision of these benefits, one of my female interviews notably using a different surname than her father because she was married then, testified on behalf of her father, stating that he had worked as her driver in Istanbul, which contributed to him receiving a pension. And 
In addition to family and state support, auxiliary assistance networks emerged during this period. In 1965, the Association of Exiles was founded in Athens, primarily by recently deported Greek citizens, under the leadership of members of Leniki Enosis Association, who had been deported from Turkey in the late 1950s. Membership records, there is an example on the slide, from this still active association indicate that many members were engaged in unskilled, temporary, and physically demanding jobs in Athens. The association's primary objectives were to offer financial and moral support to members in need and to advocate for state assistance and compensation for properties left behind in Turkey. Additionally, the Association of Students from Istanbul uh, emerged as an organized support mechanism. The association's funding purpose was to foster solidarity among university students from Istanbul and generate resources while organizing activities to meet their needs. Similar associations also existed in Thessaloniki, although due to time constraints, I will not delve into them individually. And lastly, another notable support mechanism that must be mentioned is the newspaper Opolitis. Opolitis, founded by a departed room uh, Greek, initially started as a small pamphlet providing information on legal matters such as state aid and military service applications, along with job advertisement. Over time, it evolved into a newspaper catering poli to politics living in Athens. I have digitally archived all the issues of politics published between 1967 and 1972. As an example, you can see in the photo, the shops are listed with their addresses in Athens and their former addresses in Istanbul on the left. There is an, uh, also an advertisement for private tutoring by a graduate of Robert College on the market. Yeah. <laughs> on the right, you will see uh, the news from Istanbul titled Mikranaya Popoli, which includes updates on who passed away in Istanbul, whose children got married, and who had their children baptized. As more and more people from Istanbul joined the community in Athens, the advertisement page expanded to accommodate their needs. And in conclusion, it is evident that my interviews maintain a strong connection with Istanbul to this day. They continue to identify as politics and actively contribute to various fields, including composing about Istanbul, conducting research on its history, engaging in voluntary work for room politics, creating art like puppets that depicts life in Istanbul, as you may see on the slide, documenting civilian buildings on the Peace Islands and organizing the restoration of Greek cemeteries in Istanbul. As one of my interviews expressed in a book, he has written and gifted me, politics don't want to be forgotten because their numbers have dwindled. The expulsion of Greek citizens from Istanbul marked a significant experience in their history, characterized by adversity and challenges. However, the resilience demonstrated in their testimonies is equally remarkable. Their capacity to rebuild their lives, adapt to new circumstances, and preserve their cultural identity has expanded the experience of living, being, and bearing witness. Their stories deserve recognition and remembrance as they continue to shape the narrative of this community. And what I try to do in this study is to employ oral history approach and methodology to explore the appellacy's testimonies of room politics who emerged as a minority group within the historical context of the nation building process in the history of Republic. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Elif, that was wonderful. Eli, on to you. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction and for being here. And thanks a lot to Baki Tezcan and on behalf of um, everybody at the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association for having me here today. And of course, many, many thanks to Elif for this wonderful presentation of what I know to be 
an even more wonderful research project and ultimately a great PhD dissertation that is coming up soon to be submitted. Uh, I met Elif almost five years ago in Athens when she first came to conduct her PhD dissertation research. She was a little timid about whether or not her intentions were justified. Was 1964 old enough a past to be considered justified as history? Were the room polites well defined enough a community to be considered justified as an object of analysis? Was her subjectivity as a Turkish researcher minimizable enough to be able to conduct this field work without fear from bias? Uh, and all these questions were up in the air in the beginning of her research. In the period of that followed, I was able to observe how Elif dealt with these questions and more, not only by creatively addressing the challenges brought by the changing context, but also by surpassing them into firmly establishing herself among the room elites as an esteemed researcher with a good degree of well-earned trust, respect, and rapport. So based on my own experience with the room politics over 25 years now, I can say Elif is among the rare cases of having secured a quite privileged status in the community. Uh, and I can only hope that this particular project is one of the many more to come which all will be disseminated within the wider public whose awareness of the living history and cultural significance of this most important community will be greatly increased. Now, among the many understudied subjects uh, on the Rum Polites, Elif has chosen to focus in particular on the 1964 expulsions today. This is a most relevant and timely topic to discuss for various reasons. It's an event that gave way to the biggest wave of migration of the Rum Polites from their home city of Istanbul. And unlike many may, what many may, may think, it's not the 6th, 7th September event in 1955. This is also an event that accounts for the most intense exodus from Istanbul by any community in the last hundred years, at least. Additionally, this is an out migration that was initiated, administered, and executed openly and officially by the governing state mechanisms of the Turkish Republic. Yet despite all these and many other dimensions worth mentioning, 1964 expulsions remain largely unknown by anyone but a handful of people today. Elif Kevser Özer is but one of those few people who knows the subject of 1964 expulsions very well. Today, she presented us with a wealth of material gathered during her field work and archival research, which however forms only a fraction of what she came across so far. You have listened to some of those stories and seen some of those documents, mostly sad and serious, all of which are rich in meaning and all of which speak for themselves. The quality, quantity, integrity, originality and the richness of the ethnographic and historical information is rather self-evident. So it is not what I wish to discuss today. I would rather like to address the framework within which this material is placed with a very brief intervention and then draw out of this a few pointers that may structure the subsequent discussion in the following. Now, given the time constraints of this presentation, I will soon to become professional as a historian. Kevser primarily underlined the concepts of more history and anti-history that challenges the established understandings of history as her main approach in the evaluation of this material. She certainly has more to say in that respect, and perhaps I may invite Elif to add some additional aspects of her theoretical framework during the Q&A session. In the meantime, though, I would like to address also the wider significance of this work in a broader, in a somewhat more interdisciplinary context, as well as with a view on its relevance to some of our global issues today. What else can we learn from the, all these stories of Rum Polites on their experiences of expulsion in 1964 into 1965? How do these compare to the other experiences of that generation at traumatic turning points in their history? What do these individual stories tell us about the status of the community, their historical legacy, 
their cultural contributions to the wider urban society of Istanbul and of the country. How did it work to have a significant group of Greek citizens within the boundaries of Turkey? And how have these parameters changed alongside major developments in the domestic and international politics of both Greece and Turkey, such as military coups, junta regimes, Cold War parameters, Cyprus events, etc. How did the presence and the eventual removal of those Greek citizens affect the nature of the relationship of the Rum Politis community with the Turkish state, the Greek state, and the relations between Greek and Turkish states? In which ways did the minority policies get shaped differently as a result? Was holding different citizenship a matter of division within the Rum Politis community? Or was it a matter of flexibility, matter of origins, preference, or convenience? Either way, what does that tell us about the salience of citizenship as a marker of identity in the mid 20th century in comparison with other markers such as religion or ethnicity? To what extent was the level of integration into or acceptance by the wider society changed based on whether these identity markers were common or not, both in the case of their lives in Turkey and in Greece? Did the order of importance laid on these characteristics change after forced displacement? Were perhaps other markers of identity, perhaps of belonging or keeping connections to the home city come into force in the diasporic conditions of Greece? How exactly was the class dimension affected before and after forced displacement? Most episodes indicate a loss of status and class as a result of migration, taking into account mainly socioeconomic parameters. In the case of Rumpolitis, were there other aspects, such as artistry, education, work ethics, networks, prestige, etc., that allowed for a different conceptualization of their class position or perhaps quicker upward mobility in some cases? How did they compare to other migrants in the country from that respect, domestic or international? After their expulsion from their city, did the expelled retain their connections with the community? How dense did the ties between the split sides of the community remain and for how long? Can we talk about a broader international room politics diasporic community today? What does that teach us about the comparable cases of split communities, diasporic networks, and forced migrations that took place as a result of governmental decisions. Can we rethink the expulsions of Armenians, Kondians, Kurds, Circassians, Assyrians, Ezidis, Pomaks, Romas, Egyptian Greeks, and you name more and more, many others in this geography in the last few centuries under this light? Can we consider the exchange of populations? or even the partition between India and Pakistan as a point of comparison for cases of mass mobility and practices of unmixing the population. Can we see this case as yet another step in the attempts of nation states to dissolve the cosmopolitan remnants of an imperial order towards establishing purified, standardized, homogenized nations? Too many questions, I know, but only a few from among many more. And of course, you can write whole chapters, if not books about each one of those. And I know that Edith has some answers, but they're not for Edith to answer right now, clearly. Um, or, or to address in any capacity beyond what she's already set out to do in her dissertation. Whichever angle she chooses to highlight, I'm confident that it will be an invaluable contribution to the literature as we're dealing with a case that is very rich in content, very thorough in its documentation, very broad in its coverage, and very effective in its analysis. And I'm really not complimenting. I have posed these as possible research questions though, to give a sense of some of the dimensions that get unearthed as a result of such careful and dedicated investigation that remained in the dusty corners of the archives and was thus overlooked and understudied thus far. Elif's current work is surely going to be the first among many 
of hers to follow, but also hopefully help inspire more researchers to undertake this topic from these and other perspectives in order to shed light on many of our historical and contemporary concerns today. Studying the room politics is a highly productive and promising endeavor. And I'm very glad that a productive and promising scholar such as Elif Kefsad Azar has joined this path and will help drive it into a brighter future. Now, before I conclude this part, please allow me to say a few words about dear Valdelis Kichriotis, a dear friend, as I know he has been to many among you here. Vangeli and I met at the Graduate Student Symp Symposium in the US in 1998, while he was still studying in Greece. We have since been in constant connection as he came to Turkey for a summer language program, then eventually moved to Istanbul, met and married Jada, had Rana, became a Boazici instructor, and caught that terrible disease that took him away from us so soon. Apart from his many admirable qualities as a person and a scholar, Mangelis was an integral honorary member of the Rum Polites community in Istanbul. I believe he would be glad to see his name being associated with and supporting this particular research project by Elif Kevsar Azar. I yield the rest of my time to, to the questions and answers coming up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eli. Uh, we have less than 15 minutes left, so I don't, if, I, I guess if you have questions or comments, if you could do the raise hand function, and maybe while people are formulating, Elif, if there's anything you want to say in response to Eli's comments. Elif Fanum, uh, I see that you are the recipient of the Vangelis Kiriotis Memorial Award. Was Van Geris one of your professors at Boazici? Yeah, actually I was I was going to tell a story about Van Geris uh, Because during my bachelor years, I was trying to be an Erasmus student in Athens. And one day I knocked his door, Van Geris Soja's oh. door, and said, Hojam, do you have enough time? for me because I have some questions about Athens and I, I need your support and for finding a place to stay because you know it was like 15 years before and uh, finding a place to stay was very hard then comparing today and he said I have all the time I have time for my student all the time you can just come and see me and I will support you in um, any time that you need you need it so um, he found me a place to stay and he provided me a network in Athens also. <laughs> so he was he was a kind of a trigger for me to 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 know the 1964 expulsion from a room politics in Athens that one Kelly soldier put me in contact <laughs> somehow. So um yeah, I I don't know how to tell it, but I appreciate him so much. I own him so much. Okay, the subject today was definitely the 1964 appellacies, but uh, Hercule Milas, who I believe is a participant today, uh, in an interview he had, he thinks that the Varluk was a much more serious problem for the Greeks than the Apelles. Would you have any comment on that? Because I noticed one of your slides mentions Varluk in the context of how properties were going for nothing because people needed the money to pay the Varluk wealth tax. Actually, um, what I, um, as I referred in this presentation is the homogenization policies and the Turkification policies. Varluk was one of them, one of these policies. Uh, but why I, I refer the expulsion is the 
um, that there is the continuity between these warlock and the conscription policies, the 20 classes and the pogrom, the Septembriana and the expulsion. There is this continuity, but the expulsion, it differs from them. The other policies got its result in a mass migration. It is the turning point of the extinction of the room politics in Istanbul. Today, we are talking about the numbers like less than 2,000. And the, the, the expulsion, the apparatus is a turning point of this. Because people, I mean, the, the room politics uh, lost their hopes to live in Turkey anymore after witnessing the mass migration and the deportations. So uh, there is the, the link between the red tax and the expulsion, of course, because in a nation state, uh, there was the, the reflex of getting rid of the minorities. So these are similar policies, but the deportation, then the 1964 deportation, it's much more, maybe I don't, I can't say that, you know, this is better, this is worse, but it is a turning point. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, by the way. Thank you so much. Uh, Mehmet, John Bailey. Thank you so much for the for your talk. I just want to why is this date so important? What makes it so special? So how did the Turkish government come to the idea that okay, I now we should get rid of our Greek minority? So what was the political background of it? So how should we understand the motivation of the Turkish government? Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Um, actually, the Greeks of Istanbul, I mean, the Greek citizens, uh, room polites, were exemption from the population exchange. I mean, from the beginning of the Republic, actually, the room minorities, uh, were to send to to do resort to 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 any other country. That was the, the reflex of you know, as I said before, the getting rid of the minority problems. Um, and actually, uh, it was not the first time that 1964, the room politics were deported by being accused of malicious activity or espionage. There was, you know, the, the previous examples of this. For example, um, Kalumenos, the famous photographer who documented the September, the program of uh, 6, 7 September. Uh, he was also deported in 1957 because of being traitor, because he documented the photographs of the destruction caused by Septembriana and communicated this to the foreign press, the foreign press, and that's why he, he got deported. And also, as much as we know that uh, the members of Eleniki Enosis Association in 1958, they were also deported uh, on charges of aiding Cyprus. And according to Anna Theodoridis' uh, study, uh, she scanned all the records of the exile, the association of the exiles in Athens, and around 50 deportations took place between 1957 and 1963. What I'm trying to say that the expulsion was not a, you know, a clear cut starting point of uh, the reflex of you know, homogenization in Turkey. No, there, there is the continuity and the, the Cyprus problem became a kind of, you know, a suitable pretext to, 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 to take a step forward. And also um, emphasizing on the, on the continuity in the, in the history of modern Turkey is matters a lot, but also the the context of the 1960s is also important because we are talking about a society who experienced the Lausanne and uh, Lausanne ag uh, agreement and also who experienced the population exchange. 
And during, uh, in the early 1960s, the population exchange of Cyprus, uh, Greeks, and the Western Muslims also in the agenda in Turkey, in the parliamentary talk and the newspapers. But um, this is not the thing that just anti-Rome issue. For example, during 1962, uh, there is a well-known case of uh, supporting Kurdishness case. Uh, some Kurdish intellectuals and the students were on trial because of promoting their Kurdishness. And during this case also, the population exchange between the Turkmen of Iraq and the Kurds of Turkish nationality living along the border was also discussed. So there was the reflex of homogenizing the population and the Cyprus became a pretext. And uh, I, can, I can talk about this a lot, but I don't know. <laughs> my, my, my answer was enough, I don't know. We have many more questions. We have a bunch in the chat and we have Baki Tezjan and Herr Kumilas for sure. And if we have time, there's Gurdeniz Kubris. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the proper name, but yes, Baki, please. Oh, I, I will let Herr Kulbe go first because, uh, you know, I, I was just raising to have some questions in the queue, but okay. great. Herr Kulbe, please. Herr Kulbe. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank uh, Elif and of course Eli. Uh, actually you talk about my story because my father was one of the, those that were expelled and I was the other group the one that had to fa follow the family so uh, it is our story so thank you for dealing with us being interested in us actually there is a question always in my mind why why is this issue so important now in our days? Why are we interested in this? Why are we interested in something that happened, say, 50 years ago? This is one question. Normally, we don't answer it. We don't approach the issue from this perspective because it is. I think it is. There are different reasons for people dealing with this issue. Maybe the Greeks differently, the church differently, the people involved, the minority itself differently. Anyhow, this is, I don't know the answer. I have some ideas, but this is not the uh, my main uh, intervention. I, I, I want to remind something that the expulsions were the final strike that caused the deportation and the uh, extension of rooms in Istanbul. I mean, they they left Istanbul after that. But it is not because that was the, the worst blow. Varlık Bergisi, I think it was as important. Uh, the the 6, 7 September was not so important, but still it was a blow. The reason that the Greeks of Istanbul left in 1964 and after 64 is that, that before they didn't have any place to go. During the Varlitberg uh, text, Greece was under occupation, so they could not go there. In 1955, if, uh, economically, Greece in, was in a very bad situation. Whereas in 1964, Greece, well, was not, of course, uh, a very uh, rich country, but still, it was a country that the uh, Istanbulians that left and reached Athens would uh, write letters back and say, the situation is here, here is bearable, it's not bad, it's good. So actually it was two force working. The Turkish side was pushing and the Greek side was, uh, I mean, asking for people to reach. So I think, this dimension of the uh, dynamics of uh, the living of the people uh, always um, is in my mind. Well, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Baki? Oh, I just wanted to ask two small questions. One, 
the uh, Greek nationals who were staying on a visa in Turkey for so long, was, was the road to Turkish citizenship blocked? Could they not apply to become Turkish citizens? Or did they choose not to apply? Because I imagine if they held Turkish citizenship, they wouldn't be easily expelled. I imagine. I imagine. I don't know. So it's just that legal question. And the other question I have is the properties left. What happened to them? It so happens that my father, uh, he passed away, but he used to rent with two partners a little piece of land uh, on which they had a little workshop in Istanbul. And he they, he referred to it as Tereke. Tereke. That's the, the landlord was Tereke. I had no idea what that meant. But eventually I came to learn that I think it is associated with the people who left, uh, who were expelled in 1964, as well as the ones who left perhaps before. I'm not quite sure. The, uh, uh, the, the, do the people actually receive these rents that are paid to Tereke? Uh, the people in Greece, are they able to access the rents that my father paid? Or is it that somehow the Turkish government also took it and uh, basically appropriated it. Is it. What is the status on that properties? Um, firstly, thank you for your contribution. Herkül Hocam, çok teşekkür ederim. And Baki Hocam, thank you for your questions. Because these are the, the topics that I would like to touch upon in this presentation, but I couldn't because of my limited time. So about the citizenship, uh, actually, there is a kind of mutual uh, hesitations, they say, because the as much as I know from my field work, the Rum Polites, the Greeks of Istanbul, were not willing to have a Turkish citizenship at all. There are many reasons of this. For example, the first one is the feudal uh, traditions, because they were trying to keep their fathers citizenship and their father's surname and the second one is very practical because of the conscription they were not really willing to be a turkish soldier in the turkish army and during the uh, especially the second world war before the if we if we are talking about the, the generation who were expelled in 1964 they were not willing to be a soldier so uh, this was a kind of, you know, protecting themselves from the discriminatory policies of the Turkish state to some extent, not totally, but to some extent. Because uh, as much as I know that there were some Greek families who are, you know, changing their citizenships, like uh, taking Italian citizenship uh, instead of Greek one. And then during the Second World War, they changed their Italian citizenship after the occupation of Greece by Italy, and then changing their citizenship to Spain. And when the Spanish consulate asked them to send some, uh, let's say, the volunteers to Russia, they again changed their citizenship to Greece, and then they expelled, for example. Uh, there is a, some three or four families in this case. Now, so as much as I know, some, there are some Greek uh, Greeks of Istanbul. I think like like two or three families. They were Polish citizens to, after the uh, Second World War, so they were having troubles. Um, in traveling in Europe, and then they, again they changed their citizenship to Greek, and then they were expelled. So you know uh, it is not a kind of taboo changing citizenship. No, they, they they were changing their citizenship, but they were not willing to obtain a Turkish one, to to protect themselves from the discriminatory measures of the Turkish state. Mm. And uh, on the other side. There were also those examples who were uh, applying for having a Turkish citizenship and didn't receive any positive response. For example, Ivi Stangeli, she waited for 10 years to be a Turkish citizenship, but she couldn't. And also, uh, I second the, um, the newspaper archives of 1964, 1965, and 1966, 
there were some news about the deported Greeks in Athens, and they uh, they told that even though they applied for Turkish citizenship, they couldn't receive any positive answer from the state, and they got deported. So that's why I'm calling this as a kind of mutual hesitations. Mm -hmm. And for your second question, properties, um, uh, it is a kind of panorama of the um, anti-minority policies of Turkey. I mean, the, the case of uh, properties. It is personally for me very heartbreaking because I coincidence many testimonies of lost properties and uh, having trouble after deported uh, in Athens. And you know, like I heard some cases like 40 years long uh, struggle for, you know, in the court to, to take back all these properties from the treasury. And uh, I think two of two people were success in taking their parents' properties back, but they had to sell them because of the political pressure. For example, one testimony was from the islands, the Peace Islands. He got his share, actually, after spending 20 years in the Turkish court and taking his half share of his parents' house, but he had to sell it to some privileged uh, political figure from the island. Otherwise, he could um, he couldn't go and you know spend some time his property. So uh, this this is another chapter for my thesis. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how to discuss it because the properties is a kind of panorama of all the uh, all the uh, process. I mean, the expulsion didn't expand, uh, didn't finish. When I heard these stories, I understood that the, ex the expulsion didn't finish because the, the precariousness of the deported Greeks transferred to their children and nowadays transferred to their grandchildren as well. When we, we look at the, the case of the properties. Yeah. I think uh, Akis Selma Zoglu had a question, right? Well, my question uh, was partly answered by Elif because my question was always why the expelled Greek citizens living in Turkey, most of them were established there before 1918, had never bothered to get the Turkish citizen. Because if these people were in Germany or in the US, within the first five years, they would make sure to have to get the local citizenship. Mm -hmm. One of the answers that I uh, got from some fellow rooms whose parents were expelled, they said it was a matter of the army because we rooms with Turkish citizens had to go to the army and they could avoid that. As far as my second question was regarding the properties and uh, the money of the rents collected in their bank accounts, as far as I know, that all went to the Hazine, to the, uh, the the real estate, and the money went uh, was blocked by the Central Bank of Turkey. So uh, this is a question that has to be answered: Why these people never bother to get the Turkish citizen? Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is what Elif said, I believe. Thank you. We also have a bunch of questions in the chat. Do we have a minute, Baki? I could just at least read some of them. Oh, uh, yes, yes, we could definitely. Uh, if if you have time to, Christine, uh, we could definitely address them. No problem. No problem. Yeah. I mean, they're kind of all part of the same larger question, I guess. Which so one person, so Samim Akkanul is saying is asking, what is the meaning of these events now in people's memory? Is it as far as your interviewer interviewees are concerned, is it a lost paradise? Is it an ostracized mythified? Is it about grief and bitterness and endless gurbet? I think all of the above maybe, or is it a reconstructed memory that helps to build a specific polites community in Greece? And then similarly, well, the flip side, somebody else is asking, 
how these people were received in Greece, because we know the stories of how the Asia Minor refugees were received earlier. So I think maybe the question's informed by that. And what was life like for those polites that stayed even after all of this, that somehow managed to stay in Istanbul? Those are three of the big ones that are in the chat. Maybe I can start with uh, Samim Hoca's question. Um, actually, the meaning of a palace is made me think a lot. I mean, for years, it's my seventh year in years in my dissertation. Uh, and I'm thinking of this question so much. Actually, uh, since my study based on oral sources and personal testimonies is far from a general definitive and objective or objective conclusion, but it is rather an elaboration of interpretations. And in each interview, I heard a different interpretation of what happened. Mm. So some of my interviewees shared with me their experiences of living Istanbul by placing the deportation at the center of their lives, their lives. Like time was two way and one dimensional, like before Istanbul and after Istanbul. It is was it was like you know living Istanbul had created a major break in in their narratives. The time had frozen and life had never flowed the same after leaving Istanbul. And then I realized that it um, the deportation was also referring and any, any kind of excuse, any kind of failure in their lives. For example, some interviewees talking about his uh, divorce, his He's giving the deportation as the main reason of it. Because he said, like, you know, I lost my connection with life, so that's why I couldn't constitute a family after them. And for some, uh, it was not like this. I mean, the deportation means a lot, but it was not a kind of frozen time. Uh, for example, one interview said that uh, life is like this. Okay, we left Istanbul, better or worse, we don't know. And life went on. Tapandareyi, he said. Everything flows. Uh, and there are some of also who said that iki uh, oldu. What happened, happened. Uh, it was good that we were deported. Otherwise, we will stay in Istanbul and living under the pressure, under the, the, the full of fears of being minority. So these are different interpretations. And uh, in order to understand the meaning of appellacies, I had to theorize these different interpretations. Or, I mean, why somebody says that it was the, the worst thing that happened to me and the other said Papandare. So I come up with the conclusion that the resilience maybe is the key concept that I can I can understand what happened to, to these people. I mean, the resilience is the capacity of positive adaptation to significant advert adversity. And it is not a natural born ability, but rather a dynamic process. So sometimes we feel resilient and sometimes we don't. So there are different parameters. I mean, the, the class, the gender, the profession, or being talented in something like, you know, in sport or in singing. So these different parameters affected the uh, the experience of room politics and how they receive appellacies. But nobody said to me, like, you know, the appellacies was the best thing that happened to me. I should confess this. It, it, it is a really a hard experience for anybody. And I remember now um, a female interviewee around 80s 
uh, she said it was a kind of little death to me. I didn't die, but I'm not the same. So uh, it is a really a hard experience. It is harder to some who who lack of the support mechanisms to be more resilient. And it is maybe a hard experience to those, but not so much hard, let's say, to those who, who are more resilient than the others, who have the support mechanism around them. So there's not a one question, one answer to this question. There are multiple answers depending on the experiences, actually. So the second question was how they were received in Athens. Uh, again, <laughs> this is not a unique answer. This has not a one answer. Uh, it depends, again, the experience. But I may say that if um, the capacity of integration is higher than the others, being received in Athens not so problematic. I mean, if a, a person has a uh, cultural and social capital, and you know, let's say, um, have an intellectual background, so having you know capacity to integrate more democratic, more understanding people, his experience not so hard, but especially for lower classes and for women being, uh, be, being room politics in Athens was very hard in the beginning because their uh, pronunciation was different. They were speaking Romeka, not Greek. Uh, so um, they were not, you know, being an insider so easily. They were outsider all the time. And it was... Uh, very hard for them to, to be seen like foreigner and humiliating at the same time. And apart from this uh, class and gender dimension, maybe I can say something about also the age factor. Because as much as I heard from the, uh, the testimonies who were much more younger than their uh, let's say that the friends, for example, in high school students in 1960s, they were also uh, exposed to peer bullying because of being Istanbul, uh, because of being from Istanbul, because uh, they were not, you know, uh, speaking well, and they were not, you know, using the historical Greek uh, heroes in their, I mean, the, the name of this Greek historical heroes in their daily speech. I mean, the, their knowledge on the Greek history, their knowledge on the Greek language, their knowledge on the being insider was not so much. So they were exposed to bullying from their uh, classmates. So as I said, uh, the, these experiences are so um, different than each other. Uh, depend on the, the various parameters such as class, gender, and age. And I'm sorry, so sorry for forgetting the third question. What was it? <laughs> I cannot hear you right now. Uh, what happened to, what was the experience of those who even managed to stay in Istanbul after this and what kind of climate, um, what was there? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for reminding and thank you for asking this question also. Uh, during my field work, I didn't uh, do, I didn't make interviews with only those who were deported or only those who had relatives deported. Uh, and also the witness of the period, what happened after them and after the deportation. Uh, and I realized that, uh, that the, those who were not deported 1964 or 1965, they somehow migrated to Greece uh, after all, 
and because of the deportation, because uh, all the neighborhoods in Istanbul change a lot. I mean, in a year, we are talking about like, you know, 40,000 people who were left there, you know, who, who were leaving their neighborhoods, their jobs, their friends. So the city was not the same. The life in the city was not the same. Uh, as much as I understood the being a room in Istanbul was very hard because being a precarious all the time, living in the age of fear all the time, being like conscious in every time when you were in public space, uh, keeping your identity, hiding your identity, not saying your name, not showing your uh any kind of symbol that, you know, bearing that your room was very hard, even though the city was crowded, even though the city was like, you know, hosting 1000 Greeks uh, before the expulsion. But after it, the life was getting harder and harder. And also I coincided some testimonies talking about the, um, the, the, the relationship between the neighborhoods, the, the neighbors, I mean, um, when, when the majority of the neighborhood, let's say composed of the Greeks, they were feel it's kind of somehow safe. But when the, the fabric of the city changed a lot, uh, nobody feels safe anymore. Because uh, you know, being exposed to any kind of threat you are the, the only Greek in one street, or you are you became the only Greek in one apartment. So uh, that's the reason actually the mass migration, not just the deportation. I mean, the people didn't say that, oh, they are going, so I need to go. No, it happened. People said that, you know, okay, there is no future for us anymore. And that's the reason actually, one of the reasons that the, the, the changing in the, the life in Istanbul after the expulsion. Okay, I think we're out of time. Is that right, Baki? I don't know when the intended end was. Uh, yeah, we try to finish by um, 30 minutes after. So we try to finish within 90 minutes. Um, thank you so, so much for everyone. Uh, it, of course, Elif, thank you so, so much for your research. Eli Ojam, thank you for your commentary. Christine, thank you so much for sharing this and I will uh, just end by uh, sharing a page on uh, Vangelis uh, just in case there are younger people in the audience who have not uh, known him or um, you know they didn't get the chance to meet him uh, there is an Ottoman history podcast episode where people uh, share their memories uh, of him and there is uh, that you can listen to. There's also a PDF with written memories uh, about him. Um, I personally uh, didn't have a very long standing relationship with him, but I did uh, meet him. And this little picture uh, that he had shared with me after this event, he, he I was in Turkey in 2011, 20. 12 uh, for a sabbatical and during that year he invited me to participate in something that he himself had organized this had nothing to do with um uh, you know greco-ottoman history it was something that he was engaged with uh through eşitlik ve democracy party um the party for um uh, equality and democracy uh, it was a, a party on the left end of the spectrum it was a very small party but still, um, it, it was trying to engage with the youth. And Wangeli had um, organized a panel uh, that invited um, a few academics to talk about their topics. So you see there Levent Yilmaz, uh, who talked about European stuff. And Wangeli invited me to talk about early modern Ottoman history. So he was very much engaged with Turkey in all kinds of ways um, in 2011, 2012. Um, there were uh, several uh, detentions happening. There were things, students who were 
uh, being detained. And he was in the forefront of, of uh, trying to protect them. Uh, the campaigns uh, called Öğrencime Dokunma, Don't Touch My Student, was one of the things that he was engaged with. So he was engaged with life in Turkey in all kinds of ways, in daily life, in students' lives, uh, just as Elif gave an example, when her his students asked for time, he always had it. And I'm very glad that uh, we have an award that keeps his memory alive. And I would like to thank Christine for initiating the work on that award uh, and also to Julia Cohen uh, from Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt University um, now uh, for helping um, to initiate that award uh, some years ago. And I think it, it's going really well so far. Uh, do consider making, um, you know, perhaps donations to keep it going. Uh, you, you can find ways, email me if you're interested. And again, thank you. Thank you so, so much for being here. Next month, uh, we will have a WhatsApp session uh, with the winner of, co-winner, co-winner of the book prize from last year, Murat Metin Soy. Um, he, he will be featured with his book. And then in November, the other co-winner, Faisal Hussein will be featured in the WhatsApp session. Uh, the video recording of this session will be on YouTube very soon, and uh, you will receive emails about the upcoming sessions too. Thank you. Thank you so much.